Amen. All right, now Colossians chapter 2. Whew, has a lot to get into there, guys, but Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at, at three things here. Paul's care of the church, if you're taking notes, I hope you are. Paul's care of the church, verses 1 to 3. Then we're going to look at Paul's concern for the church, verses 4 and 5, and then Paul's charge to the church, verse 6 and 7. Paul's care of the church, his concern for the church, and his charge to the church. It says in chapter 2, verse 1, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So here's Paul, and Paul is really just modeling this real shepherd's heart. He's got a real care for the, the church there in Colossae, but also in Laodicea, the, the, the surrounding areas. Remember, Paul has never been to Colossae. He was not the one that directly established the church there in Colossae or in Laodicea. Paul had spent a, a number of years, three and a half years in Ephesus, ministering the gospel, and it's believed that people from the surrounding areas came, they were part of the study, they grew in the Lord and in the word, and people went back, they planted the churches, and now we see that Epaphras is coming back to Paul as he's in prison in Rome. He's sharing all this great report and Paul's just got this real heart for the church. He wants to see them doing well. He wants to see them established strongly in the Lord. So he's writing, he says, I've got this conflict for you. He says, um, I, I, what a great conflict I have for you. That word conflict in the Greek is the Greek word agon where we get our word agony. So Paul's kind of like in agony for them. Though he's never met them personally, he has a real heart for them and he's in agony he's kind of in conflict because there's been false teachers coming in there's been a bit of a uh, a push away from the lord jesus as being the the central key figure the necessity of our salvation to kind of move on to some other sorts of things and and namely that you know you needed to really unlock all this kind of secret knowledge right this heresy became later known as gnosticism which is those in the know, right? Uh, gnosis is the, the Greek word for, for to know or knowledge. And so these people were trying to say that it's not just through Jesus. You need to have this kind of secret knowledge that's only given to some. And it created this spiritual elitism, this kind of pride in people. But it led people away from Jesus being the, the, the supreme, all-sufficient one that we need. And so Paul's in conflict. He's in agony over people being turned away and even to those in, in Laodicea this is beginning to spread right Laodicea was just kind of like a sister city to Colossae along with Hierapolis is this tri-city area these three cities that were close together remember in Revelation uh, the seven churches that are are mentioned there Laodicea is the last church mentioned it became that lukewarm church it became that church that got very sort of dependent on themselves and they were content in what they had, and you saw that they began to move away from the Lord. So Paul is writing now with this conflict and concern for them as people are being hijacked, as the gospel is being hijacked, and people are, are being led away by these false teachers twisting the gospel now and leaving or moving people away from their trust being in Jesus alone. And I pray that, you know, this is something that we would share with Paul that we would have a, a conflict in our heart, a, a real agony to those that we see are being led away from the Lord. Maybe it's being led away by the influences of the world. Or, or maybe it's those that are just not being grounded in truth and, and are being easily tossed to and fro. I pray that we have a, a real heart and that we're in agony like Paul, but we're praying for those that we know that have stepped away or have not known the Lord, that our heart is, we want them to be established in Jesus Christ, that they would know the truth and the life, the abundant life that Jesus and only Jesus provides. May we be praying for and in agony for those that we know in that situation like Paul is revealing to us. And here we begin to really see now, moving on into verse two, what Paul was really desiring for them. Notice what we read in verse two. He says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I love that. 
See, Paul longed for this group of believers to be encouraged because this heresy was creeping in, right? It was dividing the church. It was establishing the spiritual elitism. And there were those that were beginning to feel like, oh, I'm not enough. Oh, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, I'm missing out. I'm lacking. And, and they weren't very encouraged. They were very discouraged. Paul wants them to be encouraged. He wants them not only to be encouraged, but also that their hearts would be knit together in love. I love that. Knit together in love. This is often the way that division, conflict, and strife can be cured, is when we are operating in, walking together in love. You see, love is that quality that causes people to look outward and not inward, to be others focused and not just self-focused as is so often easy to do. Love is key because it's, it's not conditioned on anything. It's sacrificial, it's giving. When love is paramount, we can walk together in peace. You know, when Paul will later, in Colossians chapter three, encourage the church to be bearing with one another, forgiving one another, and then he says there in chapter three, verse 14, but above all those things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Is that awesome? It's like the glue that's holding all things together. You see, when a church begins to unravel in a lack of love, that begins to be those cracks that the enemy easily gets into. And he begins to divide. He begins to add strife and conflict. He begins to tear the church apart. But when a church is functioning in love and they're being held together, bonded together, glued together in love, well then there are no areas that the enemy is able to come in and divide. It becomes that kind of remedy for us. It, it, it kind of oculates the church here from having that kind of attack of the enemy against us. And I love that term being knit together in love, right? So we can oftentimes get very fragmented in what we think, what we desire, what we do. Those of you that love to knit, any, any knitters out there? All right, a few of you, okay. You love to knit, you, like, you put that thread that can be very fragmented or frayed and you begin to knit together and suddenly you've got this, this item I have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm not a knitter. I don't know. I'm trying to use an analogy of knitting. I'm like, I'm lost. I'm sinking here. I don't know what I'm talking about. But I think the idea is like you put some stuff together and you got a solid piece now that's not going to be... Okay, let's move on here. I don't know. But I love that analogy that Paul gives that we'd be knit together. We're going to be held together in love. When the enemy wants to come in and divide, it's love that's going to conquer all that. Love conquers all. And so Paul is praying, oh, and encouraged by their love here, that they would be encouraged and they'd be knit together in love and attained all riches of the full assurance of understanding. That's a, a mouthful here, but it's a wonderful truth to the believer. You see, we can have an assurance of salvation, my friends. We have a great assurance today, but there's a lot of people that are lacking in assurance. You can talk to a lot of people that are following different religions. Uh, a Muslim, a, a Buddhist, a, a Hindu, or a Sikh. And you can talk to them about what they believe, and they might firmly believe, but you know what? They do not have an assurance. You can ask them, what's gonna happen to you after you die? Well, we hope this might happen, but there's no assurance. It's only in and through Jesus Christ that we have an assurance of salvation and life today, but not just today, but life eternal is found in and only through Jesus. Why? Because he's done the work to reconcile us, as we talked about the last couple of weeks, that reconciling work. Like, like what Paul would say at the end of verse 20 of chapter one, having made peace through the blood of his cross, Jesus has brought us in to a right standing with God and he's made us in a peaceful relationship with God now because of the work he did on the cross. Amen. He's done it all, we've done nothing, but that's why we can have an assurance because it's not resting on my ability or capability. It's not resting on my doing. It's rest on, resting on what's been done in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. And Paul is praying all that you may attain to the richness of that full assurance of understanding here. Lack of assurance comes from a lack of knowledge and understanding. There are a lot of Christians that you can talk to today that sadly profess Jesus but are lacking in assurance. They're still resting on works. They haven't, they haven't crossed over to realize it's all through the cross. 
It's all through what Jesus has done for you. And they're lacking assurance. They, they fail to understand the word of God and the God of this word. The, the lack of assurance comes from a lack of knowledge. But again, that assurance is found in Jesus who's done it all for us. Two, Paul goes on to say at the end of verse two, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Again, this, this mystery, we've talked about this last week, is not something that needed to be figured out. You didn't need a decoder to solve this riddle or mystery. This was something that was once concealed but now revealed in and through Jesus Christ. And this mystery has been revealed that we've been brought into a right relationship with God. He's taken all people, Jews, Gentiles, and he's made them one in and through Jesus Christ to where we have fellowship relationship with him, but it goes beyond that. It's not just coming into fellowship relationship. It's like what Paul said in Colossians 1 verse 27. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? Do you recognize that God is in you? Hello? Anybody? Do you see the marvel, the wonder that not only does God say, okay, stay where you are. I'm gonna do this work for you. And once in a while, I'll reveal myself. I'll meet with you, but keep a distance because eh, look at you. You know, he doesn't do that. He says, I'm gonna fill you. I'm gonna be in you. Like to where we should be walking down the street at times and just all of a sudden like, oh man, I gotta sit down. I gotta... Oh, that is like so incredible. That just hits you like mind blown. I gotta have a seat because I can't fathom the idea that almighty God is dwelling in me, that he wants to be that close to me, that he's in fellowship and relationship with me through Christ who dwells in me. And that's my hope of glory. That brings assurance for us, my friends. Isn't it good news? It's exciting stuff. Pentecostal roots are coming out. Okay, but... <clears throat> in whom, goes on to say, <laughs> in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, who doesn't love treasure? Treasure, it's a good thing, right? Anybody want treasure? Okay, a few of you, not, not many of you. I'm, I don't know why, that's fine. I'll take it, give it to me. I love treasure, treasure's a good thing. Go on a treasure hunt, it's exciting. There's anticipation, there's, there's, there's excitement, your adrenaline is pumping. It's a wonderful thing. But oftentimes it can be a letdown when you don't find it, right? It's like, oh man, I thought there'd be treasure here, didn't come up with anything, or you got your metal detector, you're like, oh, I think I got something huge. And you pull up, it's like a tin you know, coffee can, you're like, dang, that's, man, I was hoping for money, but it can be let down. But here's the thing, Paul is revealing a treasure for us that's not hidden in the sense of it's hard to find. We know exactly where it is. It's hidden in both the Father and of Christ, it goes on to tell us here. And, and notice, in whom are hidden all the treasure. All. Everything that we could possibly need or want is found in Jesus Christ. All the treasure. It's not some. It's not like just a little bit. It's not like, well, I was hoping for like a big nugget, but I just got a little piece. Oh, well, I'll have to make do with. No, it's not just a little bit. It's all the treasure that you could ever possibly want is found in and through Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. In order to find something, what do you need to do? Look for it. You need to search. The question is, are we searching for it? We know where it is and what it is, but are we searching for it? Now, in Proverbs, turn to Proverbs chapter two with me, if you'd like, because in Proverbs, Solomon urged his son to seek after this wisdom. Proverbs chapter two. Great passage here. Proverbs chapter two, starting in verse one, it says this. My son, if you receive my words and notice, treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, verse four of Proverbs two, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord 
and find the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding he stores up sound wisdom for the upright he is a shield to those who walk uprightly just keep your place there I I love the kind of example or the charge that Solomon gives to his son here if you seek her as for in other words it's like we know that you're going to seek after silver if you know silver's there you know you're going to find it but he says i want you to seek after wisdom just as though you would seek after silver because this is something that has greater value a greater return a greater reward do we see the wisdom of god in that way do we open up god's word as though we're mining for treasure because this is where we're going to find wisdom and knowledge isn't it which the bible says in in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 but of him you are in christ jesus who became for us wisdom of god and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so wisdom we can personify or look at and and equate that to jesus christ that's the wisdom that we need that's the wisdom that we have and when we open up the word of god what we're doing is not looking academically at just scripture we're looking at jesus christ which every page is about and pointing us to. We're looking at Jesus. Are we mining after this? Are we digging in to say, I want more of you, Lord. I want that wisdom, that knowledge, which speaks of and pertains to you, Jesus. I love what John Corson says. He says, why do we have to labor? Why do we have to mine for wisdom like gold? Because what I mine is mine. That is what I learn through the grace of God as I dig in and wrestle with a text becomes his word spoken to me personally. And what is mind stays in the mind. I never forget it. I think that's so wise, so good. Are we digging into the word of God? Are we treating the word of God like we would if we knew that there was silver to be found in that cave or that mountain or, or that place? Are we digging in the word of God saying, Lord, I want to open up scripture daily because I just want to learn of you. I want to know you. I want to find the treasure that you are and all that you've done for me. I want to continue to grow in these things and I want to dig in so that I might find more. Proverbs chapter three, I hope you're still there. Proverbs three, verse 13. Notice this. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold she's more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her do you hear what solomon is saying when you look to the word of god and you say i want to dig in and I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to find the treasures that the Lord is to me. When you search for this, this is of greater value and reward than anything else that you could ever possibly think of. Nothing compares to what we have right here. If you knew, when you, let's say you buy a house, and the realtor says, you know, the people that used to live here were very wealthy, and they hid a lot of their money here in the house and they haven't uncovered it all. It's still there. Would you be walking through the house after you purchased it and possessed it, walking through the house being like, oh, that's pretty cool, there's a lot of money here. Maybe one day I'll stumble across it. Maybe one day I'll, I'll find it. Maybe it'll fall out of a cupboard. Or would you be like, man, I'm ripping down these cupboards. I'm ripping up these floorboards. I'm giving, I'm giving it my all because I want to find this treasure. I think that's the, the condition that we'd be in. But how often are we taking the word of God saying, ah, oh, you know, Maybe, maybe later this week I'll get into it and see what's there. Maybe something will kind of fall out, you know. Or are we like taking this every day saying, man, I can't wait to just pour into this and begin to mine through the treasure of Scripture that reveals Jesus Christ and points me to Jesus to where I will find greater treasure here than anything else out in the world. That's the, the attitude and the desire we should have. This is what, what Paul is kind of pointing us to here now we're hearing a lot about wisdom and knowledge and again it's all i believe really personified in christ but that idea of wisdom and knowledge here can be distinguished as knowledge is that which is you know the understanding of truth whereas wisdom is kind of the application of that truth and there's a, a difference in a, a real you know quality to both uh, I, I'd asked one of my sons to go and paint the trim around our, our windows at our old place, you know. I set them all up, and I left and went away for a bit and came back and saw just only one of the, the window trims, you know, partly done and he's laying on the patio in just a full sweat. It was summer out 
and he was wearing this jacket. I'm like, what? Why are you wearing these winter coats? And he says, well, the can said apply using two coats. And so that was <laughs> knowledge, but not the wisdom <laughs> of that knowledge. So, so we know that the Lord is going <laughs> to reveal himself through his word here. And may we be those that are found digging deep and unearthing the riches of who he is and the treasures that he has for us. Now, this treasure is not gained through some intelligence gymnastics, right? Like what the false teachers were trying to promote there. It says, in whom all are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Again, it's not that some of it is found in Christ. All of the wisdom and knowledge, all that we need is found in Christ. If someone begins to tell you that there's something to be gained through this other way, this other path, this other person apart from Christ, you need to look at that and go, no, there's nothing that is to be gained if I move away from Christ. It's all found, all treasure, all wisdom knowledge is found in Christ. This is what Paul addresses next. Look at verse four. As we look at Paul's concern for the church. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I'm also, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Understand something, gang, the devil is a deceiver. He's the father of lies. He can't help but to lie. He opposes the truth at every corner. He's opposed to it. And he's at work through people now to lead others into deception. Things like six weeks or two weeks to flatten the curve or stay six feet apart, right? Things that maybe not the best example, but he gives other deception like God doesn't love you. God uh, doesn't care for you. You know, this this circumstance you're in is just a, a judgment of God. He, he wants to come and, and bring this kind of deception. The devil is active and he wants to lead people away from the simple foundation and truth that Jesus Christ is all that you need. So here's what Paul's saying, you need to be on guard, right? Because he's masterful. Notice what Paul says, lest anyone should deceive you with what? Persuasive words. The devil is cunning. He's crafty. It comes with persuasive words, things that make you think and make you go, oh, that sounds like there's some truth to that. You know, a lot of false teachers speak 90% truth, but 10% falsehood, which completely ruins it all. You've heard the analogy, right? If somebody were to make brownies and add only 10% of, you know, poop to it, you would be like, dog poop, you'd be like, I'm not touching those. Well, only 10%, it's 90% of it is good. You're like, no, no. I'm not touching any of that. So I'm gonna take with heresy. You gotta say, I'm not touching any of that. So people come with very wise, persuasive words. That's a, a mark of the enemy. And there's a lot of people that grab a hold of something because it sounds very intelligent, right? A lot of people are duped because they're like, that sounds so scholarly, that's gotta be right. I have no idea what he said, I gotta believe it. Right, that's sometimes what people think. They're like, they're just duped because that just sounded so intelligent, Man, that's got to be right. It's got to be true. Years ago, a junior hire won first prize at the Idaho Falls Science Fair by showing how conditioned people are to believe anything labeled as science. In his project, the young man urged people to sign a petition demanding strict controls on the chemical dehydrogen monoxide and for numerous reasons, because it can cause excessive sweating or vomiting. It's a major component in acid rain. It can cause severe burns in its gaseous state. Accidental in a, in a, inhalation can kill you. It can cause erosion. It decreases the effectiveness of automobile brakes. It's found in cancerous tumors. Folks were alarmed. 85% of people polled supported a ban on such a chemical. Only one person realized the hydrogen monoxide is actually water. <laughs> sounded very legit, sounded very true until you realize what we're really talking about here. Now, Paul is getting people to realize don't be bought in, don't be persuaded by persuasive words. Things that sound right and true, check it. Understand what you're, what you're hearing. Now, Paul uses some great imagery here to illustrate the necessity for Christians to be progressing, all right? He, he gives these metaphors of an army, a pilgrim, a 
tree and a building, agricultural and architectural metaphors. He notice what he says here. He says in verse um, five, middle of verse five, that I'm rejoicing to see your good order, your good order and steadfastness of your faith. Those are military terms, good order and steadfastness. Good order was the idea of the, the, the various ranks of the army that are in solid formation, walking in, in unison, a solid front against the enemy in battle. How sad it is when the church makes it easy for the enemy because we're not operating in good order. We're kind of out of rank. We're, we're all over the place. For there to be good order within the church, there needs to be a willingness of its members to, to die to self and serve one another. That's what a good soldier's gonna do. And he says their steadfastness of your faith. The steadfastness implied that they were standing strong. They were a unified front. Again, when the, when the arrows came from the enemy, they did not run and retreat. They stood their ground and they were a solid line of defense. They were steadfast in the midst of opposition. That's the idea that Paul is giving, the picture that he paints here. Some people get picked off because they don't just know the truth. They haven't remained steadfast in the truth. They don't have a firm footing in the word of God. See, when you know the truth, you're gonna recognize the counterfeit. And I love what Paul commended the Bereans over that he says there with the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, they were more noble, noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the words with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They remained steadfast in the faith and in the truth of God's word. They didn't rely on what was being told them. They searched the scriptures to see is this true? Does this line up? And so Paul is encouraged to see the steadfastness of their faith in Christ. Again, our faith is one that needs to continue on. It's not just a simple one-time belief. We don't just sit here and rely upon an altar call that we once experienced, you know, 10, 20 years ago. The key is, are you continuing on? And that's what Paul is encouraging the church in next. Look at verse six. It says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So Paul's saying, listen, you need to keep walking in Christ. Just as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Or the idea in the Greek, in this present imperative, continue walking in him. Maybe an ongoing thing, don't veer away, don't get distracted or pulled in other directions. Don't rest in your laurels, keep moving forward. That's what happens when you walk, right? Walking indicates that you're going somewhere. You're moving, there's progress. That's why all throughout scripture we see this, this reference and this kind of analogy of the Christian and their walk. If you're not walking, you're stagnant. You're just sitting still. It's just to be an ongoing progress for the believer. Continuing on as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord. So continue because here's what Paul's saying. You don't just come to the Lord and the Lord says, okay, you've received everything. Now we've received everything when it comes to salvation. But he's saying, I have so much more for you. I wanna see you growing in me, learning of me, being more firmly established in me, keep progressing. This is what Paul is saying, that there's more to attain to. And there will always be room for growth until we're with Jesus face to face. Do you recognize that? Whether you've been a believer for 30, 40, 50 years, whether you were you know, born uh, into a Christian home and were at church Sunday night, you know, as a two-day-year-old, uh, it doesn't matter. There's always room to be growing in the Lord. We'll never know it all, achieve it all, until we're with them face to face. So Paul says, continue to walk in him and be rooted in him. Now he uses this Agricultural metaphor, looking at picturing a tree, perhaps having that, you know, illustration of Psalm 1 in mind, right? The trees that are planted by the water, right? And in order for trees to grow and be healthy, 
They need to have their roots that go deep in the soil. What's going to happen there? Not only is a tree going to be nourished, but those roots provide stability and strength for that tree so that when winds blow that tree, I mean, isn't it a marvel? When you look at a tree, you look at how high some of these trees grow, how big they grow, and you're like, how does this thing just stand so straight and solid like that? How does it just continue on? It's amazing to me. And yet these roots just grow deep in, it nourishes, and it brings that stability and strength. That's what Paul is saying, what we need to be doing. We have roots that grow deep and are connected to Christ, to where we are nourished and are able to stand strong and secure. It's like John 15, abiding in the vine. When you're abiding in the vine, that's where your nourishment comes from. That's where your sustenance comes from. That's where the life is. So maybe we have deep roots that are providing that nourishment, strength, and stability. And then Paul uses an architectural metaphor that you'd be built up. You'd be built up, he says, and established in the faith. I like that. See, for a house to really be secure, it needs what? A good, solid foundation, right? This is what Jesus talked about in, in Matthew chapter 7 in the parable of the wise and the foolish builder. One built it upon the sand, no foundation there. The other built on a rock. When the storms blew, that house built on the sand just crumbled because it had no foundation. But not only do you just, not only have a good foundation, but Paul says now it's able to be built up. We've got a foundation in Jesus Christ, in the word of God. But now what Paul is saying, be built up on that. Continue to grow. Don't add to it in the sense of adding new things, but just keep growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the word of God and continue to be built up on that foundation that we've received. And Paul ends here where we'll end today at the end of verse seven, that you'd be abounding in it with thanksgiving. Giving ourselves fully to Jesus as Lord of our lives is not a dreary, depressing thing for us. When we see all that he's done for us, it should cause us rather to be filled with joy and thanksgiving. And not just filled, but abounding in it. It's like just kind of that idea of abounding. It's like, you know, Superman abound, or what is it, you know, leaping over buildings. That's, that's, that's a picture I get of just like skipping along and just abounding and jumping and just overflowing in thanksgiving when we recognize who we have or what we have in Jesus and who he is for us, the great treasures that we've attained to in and through him. It should cause us to just be exploding with thanksgiving in all that he's done for us. I pray that we'd be a thankful bunch. First Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Worship team, would you come? We're gonna close with a song here today and take some time here. <clears throat> you know, really the, the theme here today is growing in Christ. And we always have room to grow. This is not a heavy on you guys today. This is an invitation this is not, oh guys, you're not doing enough. You gotta keep going forward. You gotta keep doing more. That's not what we're saying. I want you to see this as an invitation where the Lord is saying, all treasure is found in me. You're complete in me. Keep growing in me. Keep learning, keep discovering the wonders, the greatness of who Jesus is. May we do that today in our lives. May we keep pressing in saying, Lord, I just want more of you. I wanna be solid, secure, rooted in you, built up in you, abounding in this thanksgiving. Thank you for the great treasures, Lord. May I keep digging. May I keep growing and learning of you. That's what we desire here. That's the, the beauty of our walk with the Lord. It just keeps getting better and better, my friends. That's what we want to see happening in our lives. Let's stand together. Let's take some time. Wait on the Lord here.